probably it was around about 20 years ago and the museum was the Osterbank Folk Park was looking at um, ways that it was a, a, a um, better tell the story of Irish migration to um, America, particularly along the, Ap- the Appalachians. I was looking for more rural rural houses to, to uh, tell the story, and they were looking also to uh, expand the geographic area that we looked at, because um, early on most of our houses had come from Pennsylvania. So there was another house come in from West Virginia, and then this house was found in Northern Tennessee. The house f- f- fitted what the museum wanted to do because there was a direct Irish migrant story uh, involved. The Irish migrant was quite well known in the area. He was a guy called Hugh Rogan, and the house that presented to the museum back at that point in time was only part of the original house. It was actually an extension to the original house. But the original house had been taken to a museum at Fort Bledsoe, just a few miles outside of Nashville. So the museum was more than happy to have what was the second generation extension and um, funding was secured. It was taken down brick by brick by uh, an American company, packed into containers and then brought over to Ireland and then reassembled here by uh, an Irish, Irish company. It was the first house that was brought to the museum that wasn't a log structure, it was in fact all brick, but um, the bricks were all numbered and we decided to put the bricks back up in the sequence that they had come down and so it was a perfect reconstruction of the original house. The Rogan, the Rogan family uh, came from the parish of Ernie, which is very close to where the Folk Park is situated, probably only about 15 miles down the road. The first, the emigrant, the first emigrant uh, to America was Hugh Rogan. He actually married uh, a local girl called uh, Anne or Nancy Duffy, and they had a child, Bernard. Now, Hugh must have been reasonably well off because he decided to go to America to see if America would be suitable to emigrate to. So he left Nancy and and his son with the idea of coming back within a year he took some cloth for sale and went to America with his cousin. Now the year of the land in America was 1775, next year was the American um, War of Independence, so it was impossible for Hugh to get back home. Hugh took part in the American War of Independence. Um, towards the latter part of that war, he was also involved in making maps in northern Tennessee and then after the war was over, he returned to Northern Tennessee with a party of uh, settlers. Think about making maps. That's the the the, the first um, element of colonization. You can't colonize until you make a map. And then once you make the map, then the settlers come, and then he was part of that settlement process that pushed the um, native people off the ground, uh, settled the ground, and then with the desire to make money, the area that he settled in uh, was capable of producing cotton, and cotton being a plantation crop, the most profitable way to produce cotton was to make use of slave labour. So you push the Native American people off, you take their land, and then you uh, you force uh, African Americans through slavery to then work on the land to produce your wealth for you, and that's in a nutshell, what Hugh's story was. Now, Hugh had intended to go back home to pick up his wife and his son, but he was told that his wife had now thought Hugh to be dead and that she had actually been married in Ireland. And in order to not cause a scandal, Hugh decided not to go back to Ireland. So he remained in, uh, in, in, in America. Because he was one of the early, early settlers in Northern Tennessee, he acquired quite a large proportion of land. Again, being an early, early settler and having a lot of military experience, he was involved in quite a number of encounters and skirmishes with indigenous people in the area. And he was known um, 
pejoratively as an, uh, an engine fighter. So we can see that he, he, he was a man that was prepared to um, use force of arms to take the land that he was on. So we ended up with a couple of hundred acres um, outside of Gallatin, not far from Nashville. And then about 18 years later, after leaving Ireland for the first time, he, he has heard now from people who've come back, who, who've come from Ireland, who knew his wife, he finds out that she actually never married and that she's still waiting for him. So within a year, he went back to Ireland um, found his found his wife and his son and brought them back to America. During the time of deconstruction of the house, the dismantlers found uh, a few unusual bricks and they left them to one side so they weren't put back into the house again. Uh, two of these bricks of the greatest interest, one had a, a, a small child's footprint on it and the other had a small child's handprint. Um, the assumption was that this would have been an enslaved child who uh, would have been running around the brickyard. Um, the brickyard used for making the bricks would have been, we haven't identified exactly where it was, but would have been reasonably close to the, where the Rogan house was actually, actually, actually built. So at the time, um, these bricks were just used in the house structure, but we, we didn't put them back into the house structure, we kept them, we kept them to one side. The name Rogan is quite common around Nashville and Gallatin, but there's two, shall I say, f Rogan, Rogan families. There's, for want of a better word, a white Rogan family, and then there's a, a black Rogan family. The Rogans themselves, the original Rogans, were Catholics in religion, and they actually kept their Catholic religion, even though they were, came to America uh, at a time when the Catholic Church wasn't really established there. So it took a lot of effort in their part to remain Catholics, f you know, until the 1840s, 1850s, when the um, Catholic Church became more established um, in that area and in terms of having a, a parishes and parish church. But one of the things that the Rogan family always did, they always had their enslaved children baptised and as was common on most plantations the enslaved children were given the surname of the enslavers so the children would have been had the surname Rogan as well. Both sides of the uh, after abolition of, 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 of slavery the black um, Rogan element were able to make their own lives and the white Rogan element um, still owned the land and you know um, would have taken all their jobs and remained in and around the and around the area. When the house was taken into the museum, uh, over time there were a few, I'm not sure exactly how many, but there, there were a few coming together off the two sides of the family, both the, the black side of the family and the white side of the family, and there's photographs of them all seven around this um, original Rogan house in the museum. Um, having spoken to some of the academics involved in this, it would seem that there's quite an attachment on the on, on the Black Rogan family side to the house, that that's where their ancestors um, were, even though they were enslaved, and that's part of their of their history. And the, the photograph does show both elements of family mixing together in and around the house. My reflection would be more just that, you know, the enslaved because I would tell the stories about as bad as and slavery was and people have been terrorised to work for nothing. Part of the story was that, the, you know, not only were you, were you owned, but your family was owned and your family could be broken up. So that, that child at 10 or 12 could be separated from the mother and the mother could be sold off. So that, to me, that's like really poignant. It's just you know how completely broken your life was, how much control that slavery had over, over your life. When the Rogan house was brought over, every individual brick on the house was labelled with um, a piece of uh, plastic that was stuck to it and then 
as the bricks were taken. There were numerous photographs taken showing the exact positions of all these bricks with the numbers on them. And then when the house was taken down, the bricks were put into uh, boxes according to their number and their position in, in the house. So whenever the boxes were all brought out, um, the numbered boxes corresponded to um, different areas of, of the wall. So we knew which, which boxes to open at, at the start and then to rebuild the house. But obviously it's quite a slow process because every brick had to be brought out and every brick had to be put back into the same place that it came out of because that's the way that they had been uh, numbered. The Austin American Folk Park is an open area museum with uh, a number of houses for, with a number of original houses that were reconstructed on, on the site, been brought in from both Ulster and America. It very much reflects the migration of Ulster people from the north of Ireland to rural America, uh, uh, particularly along the Appalachians. The American, it has American houses from Pennsylvania right down to uh, Tennessee. The museum attempts to tell the story of Ulster migration by using the houses as a, as a vehicle for costumed interpreters to tell the, 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 the family story of the people that owned these houses and thereby um, tell the wider story of Irish migration to rural America. Mm-hmm.